Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of The Chocolate Life Live. My name is Clay Gordon. I'm your host today, and I'm also the creator and the moderator of thechocolatelife.com. Today's topic is on all the news that's fit to eat, as well as an AMA Ask Me Anything. I do one of these episodes of The Chocolate Life Live every month. Um, and if you are a member of The Chocolate Life, what I can, uh, what I can l- let you know here is that I also do a private members only AMA uh, once a month. And um, what I will do is um, in the notes for today's session, I will let everyone know what the date of that is for the month of July. Um, If you're a member, you can sign up and you can join the AMA. There's no extra charge. Um, If you are a member, just get together, hang out on a Sunday and um, ask and answer questions. Um, If you're um, watching today, no matter where you are in the world, whether you're connecting from LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, wherever it is, um, give me a shout out in the comments. Let me know where in the world you are connecting from. And because today is an AMA session, you can go into the comments um, and then ask your question in the comments and I will attempt to get it answered um, over the course of the upcoming hour. And with that, um, let's just jump into things. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to do is uh, a bit of news is to let everybody know that um, over the course of the last couple of days, um, I've uh, in, put together um, some changes on the chocolate life. The first one of which is visible on the homepage in the top navigation. Um, what you will notice now in the top navigation is I've uh, collapsed the number of items that exist there. Um, and there are also now a bunch of drop down menus. So you can click on the drop down menus and you can go find things. If you actually want to go to the page, you click on the word. So I just wanted to just make things a whole lot simpler. I need to thank my developer, um, um, Salahim, for working uh, and putting this together. It's not something which is a normal feature of the Ghost platform. Uh, And he implemented it, uh, I think, commercially first for the first time for me. Um, Another thing that we did over the course of the last uh, few days is that we moved all the comments from an external commenting system um, into the Ghost native um, platform for commenting. Um, This just makes it a whole bunch easier for everyone who is a member to be able to comment on posts on the Chocolate Life. Um, And so with that, I also want to point out a number Another bit of new and interesting news is that a longtime Chocolate Life member who's down in Costa Rica contacted me a couple of days ago and say, hey, I'm selling my cocoa farm. So if you are interested in purchasing a cocoa farm um, in Costa Rica, you can go click on this post and you can learn more about the cocoa farm opportunity. And uh, if you are interested, there's a link to an email down here where you can contact the seller and let him know that, ooh, I heard about your cocoa farm. And um, I'm interested in purchasing it. Um, It's, I'm not going to go into detail about it. You can go to the post on the Chocolate Life and you can find out about it this morning. If you were a premium member of the Chocolate Life, you would have received an email about this offer um, a little while ago. So you get on the short list of notifications uh, for being a premium member. So I also want to point out before we begin that for every single one of these episodes of the Chocolate Life Live, um, I produce a, a post right? And that post, uh, number one, has got a couple of regular components. Um, You can link to it on YouTube, um, on LinkedIn, and Facebook after the fact if you want to watch it. Um, There's also an episode overview, what it is that I hope to do during the course of the episode, and then links to resources. Now, because of the nature of this particular um, episode, I haven't posted the resources in advance. Um, What we'll do is we'll go through those resources And then um, afterwards, I will go and post the links to those resources. So you don't have to be paying attention to the URLs or anything like that. I will just, I will make sure to post all of them after the fact. And with that, I want to um, um, give a shout out um, to Kjell uh, from Norway, uh, Fjorden Chocolada, um, who says he's on holiday in Spain. I think that's a lovely idea. And um, so, um, and I know, Kjell, I got your email this morning. Um, about your question. And if you want to put it in the comments so I can put it up on the screen, I will get to it. Um, But I think I have some answers for you. And that's another thing. If you are a member of the Chocolate Life and there is one of these AMAs, what you can do is you can send me an email in advance and I will I will do some preparation. I will do some homework before the live stream to see if I can get um, your question answered. And also a big um, hello to Mike King from Encore Coffee in Kansas City. Hey, everyone. Uh, Thanks for joining me this morning. So having said all that, what I want to do is I want to start off with a little bit of whimsy this morning when it gets to the chocolate news. Um, And this comes from ITV, which is um, a British television uh, network. 
and who says that there is a 110 year old woman, uh, woman from Ferrum, uh, which is in, um, uh, I forget, Hampshire, um, in the UK, who says that one of the secrets, one of the secrets to long life is chocolate. I think we knew that. She goes down to say um, she walks every day. Um, she has never owned a car, often enjoys ice cream or chocolate bar before settling down to a night's sleep. Um, and she does walk, she walks every day and uh, attributes part of her long life to consuming chocolate on a regular basis. Um, I have to say that, you know, I just turned 65. People go, eh, you know, Clay, you don't really look 65. And I go, well, I, I attribute it to clean living in chocolate. And I too have not owned a car in now more than 13 years. Um, and I walk every day. So maybe there is something um, other than good genes to this whole idea. But having found this particular good story, good, good, feel good, good news story, um, I, this came into my note box, no, um, my inbox this morning, which is that there was some research done. And this I found um, at the, the Agricultural Research, uh, Research Service. Um, I'm on their mailing list. And they say that dietary guidelines um, meet NOVA. Um, and for those of you who know the chocolate life, I've I sent this off to Keith Ayub, who's at the um, Einstein um, College of Medicine, and um, he's a pediatric nutritionist. I'm going to have him take a look at this, and we're going to ask the question um, about whether or not it is possible. The survey says that you, that you can create a healthy dietary pattern using almost solely um, ultra-processed food. And an ultra-processed food is a processed food is uh, an ultra processed food is a processed food which consists of processed foods. Uh, you know, we for years the dietary advices go for more naturally, more naturally produced things. You know, away from snack foods, away from junk foods, which tend to be ultra processed foods. Um, and this suggests that um, you can actually have a healthy diet which consists of mostly ultra processed foods. Now. Uh, maybe um, I'd like to see more than one study. And obviously we'd like to do some meta research on this uh, in order to be able to see if it's supported other ways. Um, but through um, a, a post that came in um, this morning from the Specialty Food Association of America, what we find is that what they call center um, aisle foods in the grocery store, uh, which tend to be things which are packaged and canned. What we find is that um, that is where persistent inflation um, here in the United States and around the world, where it has um, not um, deflated quite as, as fastly, the, the prices have not come down quite as quick as other places. So we found the potato chips and ultra processed food rose 17% um, over the last year. Um, mayonnaise, maybe an ultra processed food, depending on the brand you get, uh, are up 23%, apple sauce, uh, applesauce up 22%. And so what we may, it may be that it's possible to be able to have a diet which is good for you based on ultra processed foods. But if we go into the grocery store right now, it looks like that most might be um, an extremely expensive way to um, put together a diet. So something, something to consider there um, when we take all of those things together. Um, I want to do a quick, um, quick stop here um, and uh, recognize um, a comment from uh, Jonathan McKenzie, who's connecting via LinkedIn from Liverpool in the UK, um, who owns a cacao business called Cacao Prana. Um, it's been his mission and purpose for the last four years to walk in life with cacao as it has changed the course of my life, consuming the medicinal medicine in its 100 ceremonial form. Um, so he's also made it his purpose to hold cacao ceremonies and well-being events. Well, hey, uh, thank you very much for connecting with us, um, Jonathan. Um, I, I think it's an, it's an interesting path to take. Certainly there are other people I know who have, um, who have done, those, uh, done those things. I think that um, mindfulness and cacao ceremonies and things related to what is quote unquote called ceremonial chocolate um, can be a part of an overall wellness ritual. Um, and um, um, if it's working for you and it's working for the people around you, um, I think it's something that um, you uh, can go and pursue. So thanks for sharing um, that uh, with me. Uh, from a news perspective, let's jump back on to where we were. Um, what we do is we find, um, so Easter sales data, this is from Confectionery News, as you can see, is that Easter sales data 
Um, and this is probably going to be mostly in the UK because most of these brands, I don't think are available in the United States yet, um, is that, um, is that the uh, free of cacao, so the cocoa alternative uh, brands. So here's one called Nomo. Um, there's one Win Win, um, Johnny Drain, who um, I may have mentioned before. There's a company called Nocoa, um, which, uh, which I've reviewed on the website uh, on the Chocolate Life before. What we're finding is that non free from, free from chocolate brands. Um, so reported stellar Easter achieving a 45% growth compared to the total market's growth of 17%. So here's where we might want to pay attention to understanding a little bit statistics. So what we might find is that these products are perhaps um, a year old or two years old at the most. I don't know exactly how long they've been in the market, but what we need to do is we need to go, okay, that you know, the value of the market was X last year and it grew a lot this year. Whereas a market which is perhaps hundreds of times, hundreds of times larger grew at a smaller rate, which is not to be um, unexpected. So we find, for example, in the United States over the last uh, couple of years that the overall um, chocolate confectionery sector might have been only grown, been growing at three to 4% per year where a specialty chocolate is growing at um, maybe 10% a year. What we find is that the specialty chocolate segment is, you know, well under a billion dollars, whereas the larger segment of the market is, you know, close to $20 billion. And so while there is some interesting, you know, absolute growth in the market, um, and then, um, so there's absolute growth in the market, and then there's relative growth um, in the market, which we're seeing here in the data. But comparing the two um, doesn't help unless we know the magnitude um, and the history of growth among the two sectors. So I think it's interesting that people are saying, I want cocoa, which is free of chocolate. Uh, one of the drivers of that may be um, people who are allergic to something in chocolate, who want the taste but can't consume um, anything from theobroma cacao. Um, then there are going to be other people who are concerned with um, the illegal child labor and deforestation and other issues associated with chocolate and therefore want to avoid it. And they're doing that by going to a, um, a free from chocolate alternative. Um, again, I think it's interesting to think about, but the statistics, the way they are presented, the numbers, the way they are presented, make me kind of wonder that I would need to do um, dig into and do a little bit more research to understand the exact um, um, value <laughs> of the numbers that were being given. But I wanted wanted to go in there and say, hey, um, if you know, you know, this idea of chocolate, which doesn't quote unquote chocolate, which doesn't um, contain any chocolate, um, is of interest to you, then um, it is a sector which is growing. Um, and that is interesting in and of itself. Now, I, I particularly don't believe that it's going to take over the market unless there is devastating climate change, which means that cocoa um, is going to become extremely scarce and therefore only available to people who can really afford it. Um, and what will happen is that um, free from chocolate will be what people have in terms uh, when they buy candy bars from chocolate confectionery. Um, that is I think that's the scenario under which that will happen, um, if it happens. Um, but it's interesting to know that um, this um, that the sector is growing, at least in the UK. I don't have any comparable data um, for the United States. So I want to answer this question, AMA, what exactly is ceremonial cacao? Um, so um, if you go, Mike, so if you think about it, um, cacao is has been connected to creation myths in Mayan tradition. Um, I don't know how much actual archaeological evidence that um, connects cacao to creation and other myths um, in South America, for example. So in, you know, where cacao originates in what is now Ecuador, for example. Um, but certainly in the Mayan tradition and in the Central and Mesoamerican tradition, there is a connection of cacao into creation myths. And the idea is that there is a perhaps a special form of cacao, um, which might be um, a particular set of genetics. So we're looking at criollos. Uh, we're looking, for example, um, we are looking at cacao, which is minimally processed. So it's going to be raw. 
So it's not going to be roasted. And the idea is that there's nothing added to it. And so you take this um, paste, this raw paste, and then which should be higher um, in the chemicals, which um, affect brain chemistry, among other things. And then you use it in a sort of ritualistic ceremonial context. Um, so it might be part of mindfulness. It might be part of um, prayers to a, a god or gods. For example, I don't think that's necessarily necessary, um, but um, it is um, a form of uh, it is a form of um, cacao. Again, 100% um, paste, no added sugar, no added anything. And then what you do is you um, often melt it. Um, into water and you'd consume it as a beverage in this ritual context. Um, now, if this is something that's of interest to people, I do know people who are involved, I have friends, uh, friends of the channel um, who are involved in ceremonial cacao, who are cacao growers. Um, and we can um, see if we can do a deep dive on this topic in the future. Um, if, if anybody is interested, let me know in the comments, uh, in the comments here and in the comments on the post on the Chocolate Life. And we can, we can go there. And Mike, hopefully um, that answered the question. And Jonathan, you're involved in this, um, you know, in a, in a daily basis. Um, it's, I, I want to know if I did a good job or a bad job in representing your point of view. Um, I do know Pablo Sproul. And so I'm familiar with the work that he's been doing uh, for quite some time. And there are people here in the United States that I know who are um, doing exactly, um, who are also working in ceremonial cacao. So I hope I represented um, the topic um, uh, fairly, um, if not, uh, if, and, and reasonably fully at the same time. So um, one of the things that's also been coming through, so I subscribe to Confectionery News. And so I get, you know, a couple of times a week, I'll get newsletters uh, or emails from them, which have a bunch of um, topics in them. So here's an interesting thought. And the reason why I'm presenting this is there's been a through line um, in several of the Chocolate Life live episodes. We did one on quality. We did one on climate change. We did one on Tony's Chocolate Lonely. Last Friday, this coming Friday, I'm doing a Chocolate Life Live where the title is Who Decides What's Fair? And we're going to do a deep dive on that notion. But what we're here to do is we have Rainforest Alliance calls for a new vision to address um, the global crisis. Now, one thing, if you go back to last week's or last Friday's Chocolate Life Live, I did post um, a very, very interesting critique of what are called multi-stakeholder initiatives. And the Rainforest Alliance... Um, qualifies as a multi-stakeholder initiative. But it's interesting. The old sustainability models are good, but not good enough. And, you know, one of the things that I know about Connect Confectionery News is they tend to report press releases. Um, I don't necessarily knew they do a lot of their own independent fact-checking on press releases. And so this strikes me as what they've done is um, Anthony, whom I've met at a, on a number of different occasions, Anthony Myers, who's the author here. Um, we've met on a number of different occasions in the past. For example, he was at the 2019 uh, Berry Calabat launch of Whole Fruit. He was in Venice last year for the launch of Second Generation Chocolate. Um, so what the Rainforest Alliance says that drawing on three decades of experience, we reviewed our learnings about what works and what does not to shape our 2030 strategy. Right. What they say is we must respond with unparalleled speed and scale to shift the course of sustainability transformation. Now, one of the things which I think is really, really important here, and this is something that we've talked about at all, is that no place in this report or no place in the reporting about this report has Rainforest Alliance taken on any responsibility for guaranteeing the markets for the products that are certified. Right. So if there is a cost to Rainforest Alliance certification, it is it is primarily uh, the responsibility of the cooperative or the estate holder who is seeking the certification. And Rainforest Alliance is not taking it on. I'm not taking on responsibility uh, for making sure that there are sustainable markets. And those of you who know me and who have followed me over the course of the last couple of months um, or longer, know that sustainable markets, so things that happen in consuming countries that say, hey, we're willing to pay for the efforts of what's going on in producing countries, this is really, really important. But, you know, it's like now what you get is you find that Rainforest Alliance works in 58 countries. 
there are certified with certified farms and projects. Number one, we don't know how many certified farms and projects, although there are 6,000 company partners. And what I think that that might mean is that there are 6,000 companies who license the Rainforest Alliance seal. Um, and this is the combination of Rainforest Alliance and OOTS. They're now merged together. Um, 4 million farmers and workers um, following the sustainable agriculture standard, which they say is not good enough. Um, 6 million hectares of farmland, 87 projects, 87 projects in 58 countries, right, to improve livelihoods and protect nature. Anyway, you know, as I made the point about Tony's Truck Alone last week or last Friday, is that if you actually look at the impact, they say, that, you know, after 15 years of being in business, Tony's Truck Alone um, in 2021 actually had an impact on 8,900, I believe is the number roughly, of uh, farming families. And when we think about the number, and just cocoa, and we think about the number of cocoa farming families, um, you know what, I could make this a little, a little bigger. Um, that's just a drop in the bucket. And when I look at these numbers, after however long it is that they've been in business, Rainforest Alliance and News Together, when, I, when these numbers look big, but when you think about the total number of farmers involved in this, the total amount of land involved compared with other things, you know, is it really, um, you know, how big an impact um, are they having? And I don't know that it's, I don't know that it's actually that huge, um, which I think is a real, real problem. All right. Um, we're finding another um, aspect of the same issue. So daily coffee news, um, we find um, coffee and cocoa, um, you know, are not identical, but there are relations between the two products. So what we find is that Fair Trade USA is freezing their price minimums, right? So they're freezing the price minimums. So what they're doing is they're engaged to some extent in price fixing, right? So people have gone into the Fair Trade USA, have become a member of the Fair Trade USA universe, expecting a particular way that the process would work and Fair Trade is saying, eh, right? We're going to change the way it works. I can have a problem with that. Um, they plan to revise the model. Um, I don't know how they are going to revise the model and how they're going to ask the farmers for their input, uh, which I think is absolutely critical. Um, it's a point of next Friday's live stream or this coming Friday's live stream. Who decides what's fair? Is Fair Trade USA decide, deciding, deciding, excuse me, what it is that's fair? It's also really important to know that there's a difference between Fair Trade USA and um, Fair Trade Labeling Organization, FLO. Fair trade. Um, there was a schism a couple of years ago. They separated. The primary difference is that Fair Trade USA wanted to certify big estate holders, and that um, FLO Fair Trade um, is focused on cooperatives um, and not estate holders. And so it's really, really important to know the difference. It's putting a freeze on minimum prices. So it's not going to either raise or lower the minimum price. Right? What they're saying is they are now launching a multi-stakeholder initiative. Right, If you read the document that I put together, that I put in last week's, and I'll, I'll put the file in this week's uh, post as well, um, about the um, efficacy, the effectiveness, for want of a better term, of multi-stakeholder initiatives. Um, so the move comes as coffee price minimums and premiums certified by a separation, separate agency at Fairtrade International are slated to increase on contracts beginning next month. So, right, so this talks a little bit about the differences between FLO, um, Fair Trade International, and Fair Trade USA. Um, they're creating a new initiative called Innovation for Impact, designed to result in a redesigned Fair Trade certified program that prioritizes scalability of volume, impact to producers, and specific sustainability related issues such as climate change. So it's really, really interesting here is that one of the things that we know from the graphs that Anthony um, um, Fountain um, presented to us um, in the discussion around um, quality um, a, couple of, um, a couple of weeks ago is that when you improve um, the productivity of, an, of a large system. So if I've got a couple of thousand farmers and I improve the productivity of a couple of thousand cocoa farmers in a particular uh, range, um, what happens is that, that individual incomes might rise to a certain point, but once the price hits a certain, a certain level, there's no 
particular level um, that we get to, it's just relative to um, where the market is at the moment, then the actual income to farmers drops as the price drops. And so focusing on scale, prioritizing scalability um, at volume or producing more, um, I am... I am reluctant. Um, so in, in the past, our, their singular focus was on premium and price. Our focus in the future is going to be more his, holistically on the well-being of producers and value to the industry. So I am reluctant. Um, I will follow up with this and find out how the newly redesigned um, fair trade USA system when it comes to coffee um, and see if any of those um, changes are also reflected in fair trade cocoa. But um, if you're into purchasing fair trade, it should be noticed that you now need to go in and, and ask yourself, okay, what is going to be the benefit um, to farmers? How is so in this redesign system, how does how do farmers benefit? How is it changed? What is the pricing? All that other kind of stuff. What happens when I'm freezing prices as the global market price increases? All sorts of interesting stuff um, going on there um, that are all related. And that's why I wanted to talk about this. So what we find is that um, climate change and high demand um, plus speculation uh, push cocoa prices near a 52-week high. And this is going to be a theme that we're going we're gonna to find out. Um, the price of many chocolate pro um, products in the store is rising. Uh, one of the reasons why these products are rising, the price of these products is rising, is because of the increase in the cost of cocoa. I think that the price of chocolate is rising in advance of the higher cost cocoa making it into the supply chain. So the manufacturers are saying, well, we know the price is going to uh, increase. The price of cocoa is going to increase on the next contract. So therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to start introducing cost increases right now in the chocolate products. Um, so there are three things they say here, Ch climate change, high demand, and speculation. So there has been a shortfall in the harvest. Um, the, um, I think it's ICO um, says, again, another article from Confectory News, um, widens the cocoa deficit forecast to 142,000 tons for the current season. So factors such as El Nino, diseases, other things are having an impact on um, reducing the amount of cocoa that is going to be harvested this year. What that means is they've reduced the costs. Demand on the consumer side, they still want their chocolate, right? Means that people are willing to pay more than they did um, a year ago for their cocoa and, and for their chocolate. And what we do is we find out that the deficit is, is up to 142,000 metric tons. So that is the forecast deficit not the actual deficit, it's the forecast deficit. This is where speculation comes in, right? And so double from 60,000 tons um, previously. So based on this, the markets are going crazy. And so there are a couple of things that are involved in this when we get there. The first one of which is that the biggest cocoa trade in more than a decade, um, Randall, you know, has basically, it says here, rattles the London market. Um, there was a couple of years ago, a place where um, a company, uh, Amanjaro, I believe, um, I mean, yeah, here it is, Amanjaro Asset Management, and it basically cornered the market and nearly doubled the price of cocoa in a very, very short period of time. It, it really did mess up the market. And what we do is we find that a single trader right, or a group of traders is just taking a huge position in cocoa. And what that's done is it's um, really, really um, got people rattled because um, there's somebody who's going in who's perhaps complicating all the complicated hedge strategies that these big companies are involved in in order to be able to mitigate uh, volatility, risk, and pricing um, over time. And so, so we need to be very, very careful when we talk about why is the price of cocoa rising, right? And one of these is going to be, okay, there is less cocoa because climate change is affecting weather patterns, which is reducing the amount of rain, which means there are less cocoa coming out of West Africa. That's one reason, right? Um, another reason is that people are speculating in the market uh, and that this speculation is, again, causing people's hedging strategies to, re, uh, to be really, really, really um, messed up. And so they are, in fact, um, um, uh, uh, 
they're more concerned about the potential risks. Um, they're, they're factors that have been taken out of their control. And so they're going to go and start um, going and start doing things like buying more cocoa, right? Reducing the amount of stocks, all this kind of stuff. So it's a very, very complicated, you know, um, a, a circle, uh, a downward spiral that the people get into uh, when things like this happen. But what I want to do is I really want to talk about uh, this particular idea um, and um, what I did is I went, I just asked a really, really simple question, which is, let's go back to 1980, right? And let's find out what the price of cocoa was in 1980. Um, and so we're looking at the futures contracts um, on different markets. Um, so we got Switzerland and um, I believe um, this is actually CCH would be the Swiss market, I believe. And what we're looking at is the 52 week high for cocoa in 1980 was um, 3,600 some odd, uh, perhaps Swiss francs. Um, it's not, um, uh, I'd have to go look and figure out what the denomination was. Anyway, so I'm just you know looking at, you know what is the 52 week high for cocoa in 1980? And it's $3,600 a metric ton. Right. right now, people are saying, ooh, cocoa at is like, you know, the price of cocoa, as we saw in um, the early article about um, from Confectionery News about cocoa reaching a recent high. But let's go and ask a simple question. I mean, I love Wolfram Alpha. You can ask it a bunch of questions. And so what I said, OK, what is three thousand three hundred and fifty in nineteen eighty dollars? adjusted for inflation to 2023. And so what we do is we find that, you know, 3350 in 1980 dollars is worth over 12,000 in 2023 dollars, right? Based upon just the simple consumer price index with an average rate of rate of inflation of 3% per year. Okay? And a compound uh, annual growth rate in inflation of 264% over 40 years. So what it means is, is that even though the dollar, the dollar number, so it's you know three thousand dollars a metric ton now, it was three thousand dollars a metric ton in 1980. What we're doing is we're completely ignoring ignoring what the difference in purchasing power is, what the value of those dollars is when it comes. So right now, um, cocoa would have to be at twelve thousand dollars a ton um, in order for it to in order for it to equal the equivalent buying power, um, the equivalent value. And this is an aspect of this whole equation um, that when people talk about the price of cocoa, they completely ignore what's going on, is that the price of cocoa in real terms, which is mean real terms, um, basically has not kept up with inflation. That if we were going to make sure that cocoa farmers were getting paid um, what they uh, were deserved, and this is me, well, deserved we're not getting paid properly, living income. So even if we just wanted to keep up with inflation, the price of cocoa should be around $12,000 a ton on the market price, not $3,300 a ton. And so this is really, really, uh, really, really important to understand why looking at statistics and looking at reporting and thinking about things a little bit more critically, a little more skeptically, understanding the way the market works, right? And what you do is you find that big chocolate um, and um, in collusion, perhaps with governments um, over the, uh, collusion, uh, that's a bad word, um, coordination uh, in concert with maybe less loaded terminology. I, you know, obviously, I've, there's no way for me to prove collusion, uh, but it seems that um, there has been um, um, work that has been done over the course of the last 40 years uh, to depress the price of cocoa. Um, and while we find out that $3,350 uh, might seem expensive compared to where the price of cocoa was last year and the year before, what we do is find it's nowhere where it needs to be if we're just adjusting for inflation. And so I want you to think about that when you think about how the industry reports on itself. Um, so I'm going to put a link to this page. So if you want to go find historical prices for cocoa and other commodities, it, I just did this on cocoa. It would be interesting to see the same thing for sugar. Um, I don't know if vanilla is on this chart, 
Um, but it would be, for example, what has happened to the price of corn? What has happened to the price of wheat? What has happened to the price of sugar? Um, could be really, really interesting uh, in, in order to be able to see uh, what's going on. So, okay, uh, I encourage you to become more um, skeptical consumers of information um, and that um, to think about Wolfram Alpha, it is a, just a fabulous tool for answering questions that would be very, I mean, I would trust Wolfram Alpha to answer a question like this over chat GPT, but it would be interesting. I could run this into chat GPT or some other engine to find out what kind of, what kind of results it gives. So I don't necessarily know that I would trust one over the other implicitly, but using one to check the other to make sure that intuitively we're at least within the right order of magnitude would be something to do. I didn't do that. It's a, it's a, it's a bit an exercise that is left um, to the reader to go ahead and do that. Um, a little bit of different news um, that's going on here in the United States is that uh, in the last week, um, I did not know that there were um, import duties, right? Um, on cocoa from Nigeria and um, other products uh, coming into the United States. So the fact that the United States has removed um, the duties is a good thing for the Nigerian uh, cocoa economy. Um, uh, people who know me um, and follow me know that I was in Nigeria in 2021 on a project. And so I just wanted to go and um, say that um, um, Nigeria is one of the top cocoa producers in West Africa. It's not the Ivory Coast. It's not Ghana. But it, along with Cameroon, uh, fill out the top four uh, producers. Uh, it's like 240,000 metric tons of cocoa that's there. Um, and so uh, even though you might not want to purchase cocoa from Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, um, there is some interesting cocoa coming out of Nigeria and Cameroon. And now that there are no import duties on Nigerian cocoa, it might be something um, to consider. There aren't a whole lot of small independent exporters. Almost all of the cocoa coming out of Nigeria, as I understand it, is uh, controlled by OFI, or Olam Foods International. Uh, and so it may be difficult to get your hands on some, but it looks like the price might have come down um, recently. I want to jump back um, really quickly. So I want to, so Kel, I, I, Kel, Chel, I, I hope I'm pronouncing this properly. Um, so Kel um, sent me an email um, early this, earlier this morning um, for an AMA wanting to ask a question. Um, he's spending what he thinks and in and more time than he wants to in um, cleaning his cocoa beans. So even when he has a cocoa bean that is relatively low trash, so somewhere between a half and 1% of trash, and that trash could be sticks, that trash could be stones, it could be leaves, it could be straw, it could be doubles and other sorts of defects. It could be broken beans perhaps. So even though the beans that he's getting are relatively low trash. He spends an inordinate amount of time uh, in cleaning them. And so what he describes is he weighs out a certain amount. Um, he then takes that weighed out amount and um, breaks it into smaller um, batches that he can handle on an individual basis. Um, and then he sorts through them. Um, and he's spending much less time now than he used to when he used to individually hand inspect um, every single bean. Now, for a, a big industrial chocolate maker, um, it is the price of labor more than the cost of cocoa or the cost of ingredients, which have the biggest influence on a, uh, a chocolate. Um, no, I, I take that back. For a big industrial chocolate maker, it is the cost of ingredients. Once they've got all their equipment and everything amortized, what they've done is they've taken as much labor out of the process as they possibly can and mechanized everything. So for a big industrial chocolate maker, controlling the cost of ingredients once they've reached a certain scale, um, is a determinant of the final price. And that's one of the reasons why you find what they're doing in terms of, you know, freaking out about the price of cocoa. That's why they're doing it, because they don't have any elasticity, because they've pushed out all the economies of scale they can in terms of manufacturing efficiency. And they're like incredibly dependent on the cost of their ingredients. But for a small chocolate maker, it turns out that from the cost of ingredients perspective, um, you know, it, it is the labor that is the primary, the primary contributor to the finished cost of a bar of chocolate. So the more time you spend hand sorting your beans, right, the more expensive the chocolate is going to be. And you could double the farm gate price of cocoa and have 
relatively insignificant increase in the price of chocolate. It's, you know, I've, I've done the math on this on a number of different occasions and had a number of people look at the math and tell me, yeah, you're right. It is, it is the cost of labor. And so it makes sense. Okay. How do I reduce um, the cost of labor in terms of one of the most um, time intensive aspects for a craft chocolate maker? Because many craft chocolate makers will say um, it is, part of my definition of what quality is as a maker. Um, one of the values that I, um, one of the attributes in my basket of values that I put a great deal of um, um, weight on is the fact that I am not going to roast beans that are going to, so, or that are not going to contribute positively to the flavor of the chocolate and therefore hand sorting um, the chalk, hand sorting the beans is really, really important. Um, and you, what we might do is we might find I'm going to get a bigger melanger, I'm going to get a better cracker winnower, I'm going to do all of these sorts of things to reduce the amount of labor. You know, if how do I how do I how do I become better at um, sorting the beans? So you know, I can tell you that the slowest way to do it is to grab some beans, um, weigh them out right out of the bag uh, into a certain amount, and then go grab smaller amounts of that and put them onto a sheet pan, right? Putting them onto a sheet pan and then sorting them around on a sheet pan um, is probably the least productive way um, to go about uh, sorting the beans. Um, now they're all small bean cleaners. They come out of China, eh, about 5,000 bucks. Um, they will do a much, much better job faster than um, doing the work by hand. So, um, but um, here's something that you may want to consider, um, which is a bean cleaning table. Now, this is a photograph that I took in 2006 when I was in Barovento, um, which is in Miranda State. It's east of Caracas, just south of Quirinero region. Um, and this was at a small um, cocoa cooperative um, and chocolate maker. And this, this particular design is something that got put together as a result of a project from the Venezuelan government. Um, other examples of devices that were produced by this project um, by the Venezuelan government include a small cocoa butter press, so a piston cocoa butter press based on a hydraulic um, shop um, press. Um, they also did pin mills for uh, taking nibs and putting them into liquor and then crackers and winnowers. But here is a small sorting table. And, um, you know, if we get, so let me get to another look at it. And so, so number one, yeah, the fact is that what you're doing is you're putting a sheet pan probably onto a stainless steel work table and you may not have the best light in the world, right? So you'll notice here that this particular worker is sitting down. Um, they're comfortable that all of the beans come to them. They don't have to sit up and move, right? They can put 20, 30, 40, 50 kilos into this bin up here, right? Um, and then as they pull beans down, um, they can uh, very, very quickly sort them. Uh, if we look you know, at the way this is put together, so here's another view of it. You can see that there's a tray down here there's a tray um, and that I can push beans and they will go down here and be uh, collected. And that um, this surface is in fact a um, um, open, it's a mesh. And so if there are very, very small uh, bits, it can just fall through the mesh, right? I don't have to worry about them. Um, and um, what I can do is I can take the trash and I can pick it up and I can put it in a bucket on the side. And so what we do is we find that good beans go down to the basket in the back here. And if there's trash, it goes into the bucket here. Notice there is a task light, the fluorescent task light right above me. I can see exactly what it is that I am doing. Now, um, I did out of memory before I got found these pictures again, um, a variation on this um, in which I said, okay, you know, without the, without the, Without the hopper, which is this here, and without the light, which we should have, what I said is let's put together a bean sorting table, a bean cleaning table. And one of the things that I did, which I think is the, the thing that I would merge together. So I would merge together aspects of this table with this table. 
is the notion of down here, right? What these are, are a, an air filter from an air conditioner. So in US terms, they're 20 by 20 inches. It's a filter from an air conditioner. Um, what we've done is we've cut a hole in the table that's that size. We, run, we weld a wire mesh um, on this underneath it so um, that we can bring the beans over the mesh. If there's any dust or small bits, it can fall through the mesh. We have um, an air conditioner filter down here, and then we have a box fan, and that box fan is pulling air, right? So that we make sure that any dust or anything which comes um, from the beans is pulled through, right? And then what I would do is I would build that concept into this tabletop, right? Um, so that um, what I can be doing is that um, th there's no dust anywhere in the work surface or in, from the work surface, which is being spilled out into the rest of the environment. I'm um, having this task light here, which is in front of me, absolutely really, really important. So I know what it is that's going on. Um, and then being able to pull small, um, um, being able to pull trash and throw it to um, the sides are uh, really, really important. You know, what I did, as I said, maybe what I wanna do is, you know, have a number of shoots so I can put good beans in the center shoot here, I could have trash shoots on the side and lots of ways of thinking about what this surface looks like, but you get the idea that somewhere between this table orientation with the embedded fan and air conditioning filter and this bean sorting table is what I would do now, right? In order to make the overall process of sorting beans more efficient. Now, Cal, one of the things that it may not be the case in Scandinavia, but it is the case in the United States is that um, as a part of the process, uh, of um, cleaning beans, um, you need to throw the beans or you need to pour the beans or pass the beans through a magnetic trap. So there needs, so if there's any metal, a ferrous metal that's in there, it needs to be uh, captured by the magnets. And so what I would do is I would actually put uh, a grid of magnets, magnet, magnetic bars over the opening here so that when I poured the cocoa through that, if there was any metal, it would stick, it would stick to the magnets. Uh, and yeah, something like this is the way that I would go and recommend that you look at having a dedicated workstation where you can go and work, that it should have this, um, a, some sort of grid, some sort of mesh that the beans go onto so that, you know, I would make this mesh as large as I could so that things which are very, very small would fall through it automatically. I don't need to worry about them, right? That things like dust and um, very, very uh, small bits, for example, leaf or maybe um, sisal from the bags would just be pulled through automatically. You wanna make sure that there's enough suction on the fan to be able to do that. Um, that you know, whatever gets caught here um, is completely separate. Whatever falls through the mesh doesn't fall into the collection tray, right? And you don't have to move around all the time, right? So, you know, it, the fact is that you've just, oh, rather than doing 10 kilograms, you should just sit down and clean as much as you possibly can, right? So having clean beans around is a good thing. Just go and do it. If you're waiting for something else to happen, clean the beans. If you're waiting for something to happen, clean the beans. It takes eight hours. You just get into that discipline uh, in order to make it happen. Um, rather than saying, oh, I'm through all my beans, I need to clean them now. I can't do anything else until I clean the beans. So it's about scheduling production and then making sure that you have a dedicated space, if not a dedicated piece of equipment, that is going to be able to do the vast majority, uh, make your life easy when it comes um, to sorting. Now, you know, uh, you need, so, One of the lessons that I learned about bean sorting, this was when I was in Canada in the middle of winter. So it was around Valentine's Day, a bunch of years ago, maybe in 2015 or thereabouts. What we, had, we did is we left a whole bunch of beans out on a sorting table overnight. And then when we, we came back in the morning and we put a thermometer into the sorting table, what we realized is that the temperature of the beans had dropped um, from about 20 degrees centigrade to closer to uh, five degrees centigrade. That's because the stainless steel legs of the sorting table were on the concrete 
uh, floor and the concrete floor was not insulated from the ground. And so the temperature of the beans just like plummeted over the course of the night. Um, if you threw, you took those beans and you put them into a roaster at that point, uh, it's going to mess up your roasting profiles because the beans are so much colder. Uh, so one thing to take into account um, is, okay, how, you know, what is the temperature differential? If I put something on a table for any length of time, does um, that affect the temperature of the beans? So something to consider in all of these things. But this is a plan. It's not, the plans for this table are not available on the internet. Um, I, you know, I will take these pictures and I'll put versions of these pictures on the post for today's, um, for today's episode. So you can go take a look at them and get an idea for how you might do this. Um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be this big, but I think that one of the major things is I would build a hopper, which is capable of holding an entire bag of beans. Right. So um, it's always there, ready to go. You don't need to pick something up and move it and move other things out of the way in order to be able to do it. Um, so that's what I would do. Now, it's, it's, you, know, you can make this uh, relatively inexpensively. Um, when we built um, this table, what we did is we took an existing stainless steel work table and went to a company and all they did was cut the holes in it and um, weld uh, the mesh onto this and then weld. And this was just aluminum angle bracket. Right? I don't know if they welded it. You know, welding aluminum is stainless steel. It could be a jolly. But they just welded angle bracket onto this, right? And so it was really, really simple to do. You know, we said, you know, here's the box fan we're going to use. Here's the dimensions. You know, here's the the particular um, air conditioner filter that we're going to use. Here are the dimensions. And so we can go make it, we can go make it work. Um, now, you know, and, you know, what maybe we'll find is that, but you get the idea about how um, this works. Anyway, so, Cal, I mean, again, I hope I'm pronouncing it uh, properly. Um, thanks. It, you know, it's not brilliant. I'm just, you know, taking ideas from other places. Um, and so, seen a few simple sorting tables that were not so intricate, but the idea makes a lot more sense to me. Also, as you say, the cleaning station is ready to go anytime there is some free time, right? So, if you have some space. Um, and you can dedicate the space to a small table. Now, keep in mind that what you could do is that for a sorting table like this one, what you could also do is you could put together um, some sort of cover, which was solid. Maybe it's wood or maybe it's high density polyethylene, HDB plastic. So that what you could do is when you're not using it as a sorting table, uh, or a cleaning table, what you could do is you could actually use it as a work surface for other things that you're doing. Now, I would be careful about cleanliness here. Um, and I would be quite careful about cleanliness. If you're using it as a work table, what else would I do on that work table and I didn't, that it didn't bother me if it got dirty or not, right? So I wouldn't wrap chocolate bars on this. Um, but there may be other things that you could do. Uh, maybe if you're doing cut tests, you could do a cut test on this table, other things that are dirty, um, you can go and do that. Um, but I think that this is um, the great way to go. Now, I just want to let you know that perhaps one of the most brilliant variations on this that I ever saw um, was at, um, I think it was at the original Hawaiian Chocolate Factory. Um, when I was in Hawaii, is in the Kona region, Kona, around Hilo, um, back in 2005 or thereabouts, there's somebody who'd taken a hopper like this and put it on top of a treadmill so the kind that you walk on. And what they did is they, they fixed it so the treadmill ran very slowly. And so as the treadmill worked its way, right? what happened is, is that it would bring beans at a measured pace in front of the person who was working on it. Right? And so the person didn't have to move. They just stood there. And so it gave a nice flat distribution of beans over a period of time. And it was easy to pick things out. Now, maybe you could do that with a mesh, a moving mesh. That would be interesting. Um, but I think that for a small chocolate factory, especially that you need a fan, you need somebody to, to um, keep dust from moving around. Anyway, um, interesting ideas. Um, but, um, you know, and I would take the same idea. And if I'm doing shipping, I would apply it to a shipping station. When you're doing shipping, the last thing you want to have to do is to move everything off and then move all your shipping stuff in. 
what you want to do is you want to set up a shipping station. Everything is where it is and where it needs to be. And you think about the mechanics so that once you start wrapping, um, you don't need to move, right? And that's whether you're wrapping individual bars or whether you're packing for shipping. You want everything where it needs to be within reach and you don't want to have to keep moving things around in order to be able to um, start work, right? Or clean the place up to do some other work, right? And that's the idea here as well. There's a dedicated station where these things happen. Um, and um, the more of that that you can do in your space, the less moving things around, uh, moving from one function to another function. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, what is it that you need to do when you need to go weigh out, you know, 10 kilograms of beans, you know, then you put the bag of beans back and then you come and you take the bucket or whatever it is that you got the 10 kilos of beans in. And then you take a measured amount and you put them onto a tray. I mean, there are a lot of extra steps in there, right? And so part of what this is doing is it's uh, reducing the amount of extra movement and extra steps. And, you know, as you might imagine, that can end up taking a lot, a lot, a lot of time. Um, and we're almost at the end of the hour. What I want to do is thank everybody who's watched through. I want to say, um, again, there's still time that if you want to send us a shout out, let us know where in the world you're connecting from, whether you're on YouTube, LinkedIn, or Facebook. I want to mention that today's episode of The Chocolate Life Live is sponsored by the members of The Chocolate Life. If you're not a member of The Chocolate Life, what you can do is you can go to the homepage of The Chocolate Life or anywhere. Um, I'm signed in, so it says account here. But what you can do is if you're not signed in, it'll say join or subscribe or something like that. Click on that. There's always a free level um, if you have the uh, resources, the wherewithal to help support the Chocolate Life becoming a premium member. Obviously, um, that's something that we, we definitely appreciate. Um, it enables us to it enables me to pay for the programmer to make the changes to improve the um, functionality of the website uh, and to bring uh, entirely new capabilities um, in, in um, going forward. So everything happens. Um, you'll get a newsletter, you know, once a month if you're, or twice a month if you're a free member. Um, I, you get notifications of new posts if you're a premium member. Um, if you're interested in getting notified when a classified hits, I can put you on a list to notify you of classifieds, all sorts of interesting things. And I want to close out um, today after making that, um, um, that um, announcement and also to say, hey, if you're watching, Go click on the like button, subscribe to the Chocolate Wire channel on YouTube, um, everything you can share, whether on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, let other people know about what it is we're doing here um, and greatly appreciate it. So thank you very much for the support. Um, finally, um, a couple of things um, just for fun. We started on a fun note, 110 year old woman who claims that uh, clean living, walking and chocolate contributed to her living to 110. We have uh, the most expensive chocolate in the world. Um, so this comes from a website uh, in the Middle East. I think it's the UAE, um, published uh, on Sunday. So a list of some of the most expensive chocolates. I don't know if any of these are available in the Middle East. So it's sort of interesting that we've got this list. Um, Delefe of Switzerland. For me, the fact that I have a piece of chocolate that's covered in gold, woohoo, it's expensive. It has nothing to do with the chocolate. So I'm not at all excited or interested about Delafe being expensive. It doesn't have anything to do with the chocolate. You get cheap chocolate. You put gold on your tongue. You get this interesting metallic ring. And um, they offer real Swiss gold coins with their chocolate boxes. Yay. It has nothing to do with the quality of the chocolate, right? It has to do with um, the gold, right? And you can spend 470 Swiss francs, 520 bucks. Yay, right? Uh, but, you know, our, our, you know who's chocolate are you buying, right? There's no mention of whose chocolate that you're buying or what's, uh, you know, who, you know, I'm skeptical. Uh, number two, Toak, again, um, a really, really expensive chocolate, but I have think that a lot of it has less to do with the chocolate itself. Notice this mahogany box. Um, if you go inside the mahogany box, there's a pair of mahogany tweezers. Um, if you look at just how much labor is involved in wrapping, um, what you'll do is you'll notice that there's a lot of things that have to do with the presentation of a luxury product um, that have nothing to do with the actual product that's inside um, the box. I mean, I've made the observation that roughly 50% of the cost of a luxury Swiss watch um, is um, used to pay for the marketing around the watch. 
So if you're paying $10,000 for a Swiss watch, $5,000 are the marketing budget to sell you that Swiss watch. So you need to be really careful. Um, I was there at the Basel watch fair many, many years ago. Somebody was talking about a Chopard $2 million happy dancing diamonds watch, whatever it was that had a, um, an inexpensive Japanese quartz crystal movement in the middle of it. So you're not paying for the timepiece, you're paying for other things. Um, so I'm a day here. Um, so the, it being a reputation as being the most expensive might've been true in the 1990s. I think it's less true now. Um, it is very, very highly awarded. It's one of the most highly awarded um, uh, Italian brands. Um, and of the, I, uh, of the companies that are mentioned on the list, I think it's probably the most defensible. Um, it's important to know that Vosges is a melter. I mean, they're buying chocolate um, from Calabout and other companies. They're buying chocolate from other companies. Um, I, one of them may be Calabout, one of them may be Valrona, but they're not a bean to bar chocolate maker. And there's a lot to do with the quality of the branding. Um, you know, Mary Bell, I mean, I mean, again, she's a melter. Uh, but when you look at the quality of the artwork that's here, the artwork is done by Mary Bell Lieber's husband, I believe. You look at the transfers, you look at the way they're done. I mean, these are really, really impressive, and you get an idea about um, why um, there is visual value in what it is they're doing. It's a great, um, it's a great box. So this hundred-piece box is two hundred and ninety bucks. So you're spending three bucks a piece, but there's not a whole lot of extra cost that's associated with the box itself. Right. So in terms of the amount of product you're getting for that 290 bucks, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a great value comparatively. Um, so something to consider. Uh, the work is meticulously done. Um, the, she's got a really good flavor palette. Um, so uh, something to consider. Uh, and then you can buy much smaller boxes if you want to. Um, so I would consider, uh, consider that on this list. And then finally, one thing, um, I did not know that there were many um, Nepalese chocolate brands. And so I thought it was um, interesting um, to find this list of chocolate brands um, that are in Nepal um, that I've never heard of before. Uh, some of them look like, you know, they are sort of homegrown. Um, but um, I, I encourage, you know, obviously cocoa beans don't grow in Nepal, but they do grow in India. So they're fairly close by. Um, in terms of that, I don't know where they're importing from them, but it looks like they're doing a little bit of interesting, interesting experimentation. Um, and I'm excited. I mean, if anybody is going to Nepal and wants to talk to any of these uh, companies and bring some chocolate back, I would love to have an opportunity to taste um, some of these uh, Nepalese chocolates. And I thought they were very, very cool. And so I wanted to close out today with that little bit of news about some of the best um, Nepal chocolate brands that you can find in the country of Nepal. And with that, again, I want to thank everybody for joining us here today on The Chocolate Life Live, where we've been talking uh, about, this is the monthly AMA, um, and all the news that's fit to eat. Um, it's been fun going and doing the research, going through all my news feeds, picking up the stories to talk about, answering the question about um, bean cleaning, um, and that... Um, um, I, you know, appreciate this opportunity to be with you today um, and to uh, do a quick promotion for this coming Friday's live stream. Uh, the title is going to be Who Decides What's Fair? And it's going to follow on in the series of quality and, you know, quality of cocoa, um, why improve it? Um, and then climate change, is, does cocoa contribute to climate change? Is it a solution for climate change? Last Friday's you know, you know, is Tony's chocolate only a force for good in the world? So we're going to continue along in that vein, um, asking the question, um, who decides what's fair? And in the meantime, as we end today's live stream, I want to remind everybody, as I always do, if you're working with chocolate and you're not having fun, I think you're doing it wrong. Cheers, everybody. Until the next.